Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is energy storage for demand charge management. And this webinar is a presentation of the Resilient Power Project, which is managed by Clean Energy Group. Our, our host today is Seth Mullendorf. Seth is a program associate with Clean Energy Group working on our Resilient Power Project. And we have two excellent guest speakers with us today from Green Charge Networks and Schneider Electric. And before we get started and I pass this over to Seth, I would like to go over just a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, all of our participants today are in listen-only mode. This means that while you can hear us, we cannot hear you. And you have a couple of options for tuning into the audio portion of this webinar. As you can see on your webinar console, you can click either mic and speakers or telephone. Uh, if you do use telephone, please type in your audio pin into the telephone keypad to fully enable your uh, your audio. And a very important note, please do submit your questions throughout the webinar as you think of them. We will be reading through your questions and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the webinar with our panelists and we will get to as many questions as we can. So please do submit your questions as you think of them during the presentations and we'll queue them up and answer them as time allows. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded and we will email all of the webinar attendees with a copy of the webinar recording and a copy of the slides as a PDF. Uh, and you can also find those online at the two web addresses that you see on your screen. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our host, Seth Mullendor. Thanks, Sam. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we should have a good group of people. And as Sam said, please submit your questions as you think of them, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, so I'm just going to introduce uh, who we are here at Clean Energy Group and provide a little background for why we're all here today for this webinar. Uh, Clean Energy Group is a national nonprofit. Uh, we are funder supported. In addition to the Resilient Power Project, uh, Clean Energy Group also manages the Clean Energy States Alliance, which is a national nonprofit coalition of state and municipal clean energy funds, uh, which are working to promote clean energy markets and technologies in their states. Clean Energy Group uh, works to uh, advance clean energy solutions and um, in finance policy and uh, just across the board and getting projects done. The uh, Resilient Power Project, if we could go to the next slide, uh, works with states, municipalities, and developers to increase awareness and uh, help stimulate investments in cleaner and more resilient power systems. Uh, the Resilient Power Project uh, began in the wake of Hurricane Sandy uh, to provide uh, populations with a uh, more reliable and clear alternative uh, when the grid fails and power goes out. We, uh, we're working on getting projects done across the country, and in addition to that, advancing uh, resilient power policies and initiatives at the state and municipal level. And uh, in this respect, we produce a lot of uh, papers and reports on the topic of resilient power and um, solar and storage technologies, which those are available on our website, uh, resilient-power.org. So uh, log in there, see what we're up to, and any news and past webinars that we've been involved with. So uh, if you want to go ahead to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the webinar today. Uh, we have two great speakers. We have um, Steve Kelly, who is the Senior Vice President with Green Charge Networks. And Steve's been working in uh, this industry for more than 25 years in renewable energy and the high-tech sector. And before coming to Green Charge, he had uh, spent a number of years in the solar industry as a leader for Silco, uh, Silcor Energy, GRI Energy, and uh, also SunPower. Also, we have Mark Johnson with uh, Snyder Electric. And he's part of their uh, Smart Cities and Megawatt Energy Storage Microgrids project. He has been a part of the uh, Department of Energy and um, IBM Energy and Utilities. He's also worked with Navigate Consulting, and Johnson Controls, and several other startups. So both of these companies are very active in uh, energy storage and solar and storage technologies and demand charge reduction. So the question is, how does demand charge reduction fit into resilient power? Well, the fact is that you can design a system to reduce demand charges and that system can also play a part in adding 
more resilient power for a facility by providing power for critical load uh, when the grid is not available, especially if it's combined with solar technology so that the battery can charge uh, when it's been depleted. The other side is that systems that are designed for resilient power projects can also participate in demand charge reduction, as well as some other revenue streams that uh, Steve and Mark are going to talk about, in addition to demand charge reduction. So this is a way that uh, these systems can be funded and paid for partially, if not fully, depending on what the market sector is that you're participating in. Uh, because, unfortunately, there is not much of a market for resilient power at the moment. It means different things to different facilities and uh, different customers, but it's difficult to put a market value on resiliency. Also, resiliency is not just having the power on when uh, grid power is unavailable, when uh, there are natural disasters, storms, or any other sort of emergency. Resiliency also can play into account in economic resiliency allowing people to pay for their electricity bills. And this is another sector where energy storage, solar and storage, uh, can come into play. Demand charges are right now applied uh, primarily just for commercial and industrial customers, uh, but more uh, and more utilities are looking at uh, demand charges for residential customers as well, and this could have a very big impact across the board. So. That's why we're including this as part of our Resilient Power Project. And um, I'd like to now turn it over to Steve so he can tell you about what Green Charge Networks is doing and a little bit more about how this all works together. All right? Great, Seth, and thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity and the Clean Energy Group and the Resilient Power Project for uh, putting everyone together here. Um, energy storage is definitely the topic of the day. And uh, our goal here is to give you a little more insight, uh, a little bit about what we do and how customers are using uh, energy storage um, to reduce their electricity costs. So let me start off uh, and give you a little bit of background about Green Charge Networks. Uh, Green Charge Networks was formed as a Department of Energy grant uh, back in 2009. And over the last four and a half years, we've been owning, operating, and managing energy storage systems to reduce the electric bill for commercial customers. Uh, today, we are the largest commercial energy storage provider in the country. And um, we primarily work uh, on the uh, different coasts, from California to New York. And as you can see, we've won a number of different awards in regards to the innovation. Uh, we have over 30 patents. but. Um, the primary focus is really helping commercial customers reduce their electric bill. And that seems to be one of the biggest challenges that they're facing today. Um, there was a recent report done by Navigant that looked at the entire energy storage sector from the utility to the commercial side, and um, they ranked Green Charge Networks as the number one on the energy storage for, for the commercial market. So why did that occur and what were some of the key things, I think, um, that people have really been looking for in energy storage and understanding it, how, how that can help them in their facilities? Well, what most people don't realize is if you look at the increase in the electric bill, the dominant portion of that is coming from the demand side in most markets. And if half of that cannot be addressed with traditional measures like energy efficiency or renewable, they're really struggling with what do I do and how do I help mitigate some of the increase in demand charges. So what we've done is we've said, okay, how do we take a look at smart batteries and smart software and really address a couple different sides of this issue? And the first side is the customer side, where they're looking to reduce peak demand charges by using the energy in the batteries uh, at critical times. But as a complement to that, you can also use this capacity to do energy arbitrage, to do demand response. Uh, we're seeing a push, especially in the East Coast, into microgrids and resiliency or in island environments. And what all of them are looking for is a turnkey solution that really doesn't have a lot of impact that's, or that is difficult to uh, get operational in their facility. What most people don't see on the energy storage side really is the utility portion of this. So. The utility side is looking for the ability to use battery storage to reduce infrastructure costs like substation deferral or transformer upgrades. They're also looking at it for tying it directly to distributed generation to help mitigate some of the impacts of 
the infrequency of those of those generation assets like ramp rate control, cloud cover, but they're also looking for ancillary services like frequency, um, and you mainly see that in the PJM market today, but many utilities and, and ISOs are looking at how could they adopt commercial energy storage and utility storage to help mitigate some of these issues. Probably one of the most highly uh, publicized um, portion of this is on the renewable firming with solar. Uh, you've seen many uh, companies like Sun Edison that have launched their, their promotion of energy storage. Uh, they're one of our partners, but we're seeing this more and more tying energy storage and solar together in order to mitigate some of these issues. So let's talk about how this actually works. So, and for those of you who may not be aware of demand charges, let me give you a little bit of background about that. In most commercial customers, you have two parts of your electric bill. One is the kilowatt hour portion, which is how much energy you use, and the second is your demand charges, which is what is which is the highest 15 minute or 30 minute peak for the entire month. And what we're seeing on in many markets now is that the demand charge can be over 50% of your electric bill. So I can give you a couple examples of markets where this occurred. Um, well, actually, first, before I jump into that, let me, let me explain how the demand charge works and how a energy storage system can help mitigate that. So what you see here is the orange is a load profile of one of our commercial customers. And we would install a energy storage unit to that facility, and then we would put in CTs or be able to take meter data to understand what's happening with the building. So each month, the system predicts what is the optimal set point or what is the maximum amount of demand that the that we want the utility to see. So as it goes through the day, you'll see that the batteries start dispatching energy into the building to flatten out that load. So the new profile is this green section and that's what the utility sees. And the peak demand period, which varies from utility to utility, uh, usually somewhere in the middle of the day, it can be longer or shorter, um, is the most expensive demand chargers, and they can be 2 to 3x as much as when you're in off-peak. So the system wants to reduce those as much as possible. And as it goes through the day, it then recharges when the demand is lower and the customer is getting a significant savings on the demand side, as well as um, an advantage of charging the batteries at night when power is cheaper. So if you wanted to look at a couple examples of what those demand charges are and how they've been impacted, you can see if you look at California, which is the biggest market for peak demand shaving, the utilities are putting more and more of their cost structure on the demand side. When you're increasing your demand component 180% over 10 years, uh, it's really starting to become on the forefront of most energy managers and commercial customers on how do I address this. If we keep going here, you'll see a few customers that have adopted energy storage, and it's a broad spectrum of cities, schools, hospitals, counties, large retailers, industrial customers, and what they all share is a volatile load profile. So it could be as small as a 7-Eleven, which is installing a 30 kilowatt, 30 kilowatt hour system, or someone as large as, let's say, Cal State Fullerton, which is a one megawatt, two megawatt hour system, all to address this peak demand part of their bill. If you take a look at some of the uh, other markets that um, are viable, it can be breweries, schools, industrial, farming, uh, pharmaceuticals, retail. Very, very, there's, there's almost every market that has some volatility in their demand side that could benefit from energy storage. If I go to giving you some examples of what the savings looks like um, by different sectors, you can see it, it can vary anywhere from a very small retailer like a 7-Eleven where you're getting about $7,000 in savings a year to something like a large industrial or a college campus, which is closer to $200,000 to $250,000 a year in demand savings. And if you look at the life of the project, we're starting to see more and more of these where you're aggregating uh, customers together um, with multiple sites, and they're starting to see two to three million dollars in savings over a 10-year period. 
So how are many of these customers doing this, and, and, and what is the solution that we bring to the market? Um, the solution that we bring to the market is really based on three key factors. One is intelligent software. The second is the hardware, which is primarily based on lithium-ion uh, batteries. And the third is an innovative fin financing approach, which has really jump-started, uh, I think, the adoption of this. Uh, we rolled the, our financing solution out about uh, 18 months ago. And in the last nine months, uh, we've added about 35 megawatt hours of batteries and commercial customers. And we're seeing that trend growing uh, even higher uh, as we currently keep moving forward with new customers. So what is the software and why does it work? Um, the software, which is really the heart of the solution and the intelligence, is a learning software that constantly is adjusting to the change in the building load and variations in weather. If you think about a building, it performs very differently in the winter than it does in the summer. So the software has to be adaptive and figure out what to expect each month in each of the peak demand periods in order to use the batteries most efficiently. Now our software has been in, in use now over five years um, and it's really focusing on how do I create that set point at the beginning of the month and then hold that over the remainder of the month to get the most savings for that customer. The other thing that the software does is it takes a daily weather feed so we know how the building would perform. Because if you happen to have a normal profile, let's say in February, and you get a heat wave, that building's going to perform very differently than if it didn't. And so it's got to constantly adjust to that information. The other thing that the software provides is the ability to calculate the unutilized capacity in those batteries uh, really on a second-by-second -second basis. And we can use that available capacity for other utility programs like demand response, frequency, uh, ramp rate control, and our customers can get additional savings uh, in addition to the peak demand uh, portion of their bill um, without having to do anything. The second component uh, that I mentioned was the hardware piece. And the hardware platforms um, can be installed both indoors and outdoors. It's, it's a much smaller footprint than most people think. The unit that you see right here is a 30 kilowatt, 30 kilowatt hour system, and it, rep and it sits in a two by two and a half foot footprint. Um, we primarily offer that configuration as well as a 250, 500 kilowatt hour system uh, that we tend to put outdoors for bigger systems. All of those you can add multiple units to in order to really fit the needs of that specific uh, building. The primary focus, though, in all of our hardware is around safety. Um, we think it's one of the most critical things. We use a Samsung battery system as our primary uh, battery supplier, and that comes with a direct 10-year warranty. The other thing we've learned uh, over the last five years is it's extremely important to keep these batteries operating at a cooler temperature. So we've included HVAC uh, in all of the units in order to operate those batteries with the highest level of performance and reduce the D-rate uh, of those batteries over the life of them. And if you move to the last piece, uh, is really the financing instrument that about 95% of all commercial customers have been using uh, in the energy storage market today, which is a shared savings approach. And our power efficiency agreement provides the ability for a customer to install energy storage at no upfront cost. They really have no risk since our financiers and us are owning and operating and managing that, this um, unit and they really get the savings. So it's been, a, it's been a very easy way for commercial customers to be able to install energy storage, have them direct savings, and, and not have to worry about the technology or the capital cost associated. Um, the nice thing about this too is under the power efficiency agreement, our incentives are aligned. So we want to continue to offer additional services that use these batteries to increase the savings to the customer, and it doesn't require any operational work on their end. So hopefully in the uh, 20 minutes we had here, I've given you a brief overview of kind of what is happening in energy storage, how commercial customers are using it, and I want to hand it off to Mark here, who's going to talk about some other ways in which battery storages are being used across the country.
Good job, Steve. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Johnson, and I'm with Schneider Electric. And um, the difference between our approach and, 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 and what Steve was talking about is we're at a um, – uh, different scale uh, in, in outside the buildings. Our ideal location, you'll learn, is uh, next to your substation. And ideally, uh, the, what I'll be talking about is for applications that are campuses, correctional facilities, water plants, wastewater treatment facilities, um, hospitals, those kinds of things that have megawatt loads or above. So it's a it's a it's a little different, a little uh, uh, different than what uh, Steve was talking about, but complementary and, and certainly synergistic to all the points he made. So, Steve, thank you. Um, let me get a little. You've already heard about my background, but um, it, w one of the important parts of uh, my presentation that I thought would be a value to you is how we got here. And I think, uh, just like Steve mentioned, uh, the problem gets worse. I mean, the, the, the issues that we face with, with con energy consumption and energy cost escalation is just increasing all the time. So that's why uh, uh, I, I prepared these slides just so you could explain to other people. I'm sure you're aware of it because you're energy professionals. But uh, as Sam said, you'll get a copy of this presentation and you'll be able to share this with people on how we got here. And 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 it creeps up on you. You don't realize it. Um, and it, it, it's complicated by the fact that nobody can read a utility bill. It's kind of like your cell phone bill. You just can't figure it out. So that's how we got here. Um, this this slide here, though, is a good picture of where we fit within uh, your needs. And again, if you look at the, uh, uh, the the kind of the infographic on the bottom right of this slide, you'll see that we put a megawatt battery, which is, you know, a million watts uh, on the customer side of the substation, ideally, because that's the target that we're looking at when we talk about wastewater treatment plants or water facilities or museums or hospitals or or campuses or correctional uh, facilities, that kind of thing. The heavy loads with a megawatt and above 24-7. And, um, and again, you know, just like Steve's uh, uh, offering we have control software that's the legacy of Schneider Electric with uh, Square D and, and APC and all the companies that make up Schneider Electric but that's that's our approach so if you think of it with that infographic on your right uh, we're on the customer side of the substation behind the meters as, as you as you know and, um, and that's the focus Again, the problem is uh, the grid is getting older, and as as you know, the 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 real solution to the grid with the lack of the PUCs granting enough money for utilities to do upgrades will be a quilt. I mean, it will be a patchwork of microgrids over time. The good news is is that the batteries not only uh, support and and build in resiliency to microgrids but they also pay for the microgrids. So that's kind of the confluence of what's happened and what's crept up on, uh, crept up to us uh, over the, the uh, last few years. You know, the, the, the issue of a utility going to the PUC and getting more money to build uh, natural gas plants, certainly not coal, or even keeping the nuclear plants alive is just not gonna happen. So that's the issue is that you have uh, uh, utility uh, production facilities going down and going out of commission. Um, and so again, I think it, when you think of a quilt or patchwork of, of how do microgrids with batteries actually uh, support and, and build in resiliency for the grid of the future, that's, that's what we're talking about. And, and everybody on this phone call, I'm sure, has a mission critical facility. To, you know, certainly all the data that you have in your data center is definitely mission critical. One of the curious applications from a university 
is that when they lose uh, the data center for any particular part of time, they've lost essentially 10 years of research. So it's critical and important, uh, you know, obviously that you have uh, the, the backup and the wherewithal to keep operating. Uh, one of the other customers we have is a, an aquarium, uh, one of the largest aquariums in the United States. And, and, and again, you don't think of an aquarium as mission critical, but, but believe me, if the pumps aren't running, the fish are dying, and that's not good. So there are different uh, areas. Uh, the fundamental areas, again, that I talked about were uh, water, wastewater. Uh, these are very fundamental. Whoops. Sorry about that one a little bit too fast. So again, that, that's, that's how we got here. Again, I don't want to um, go too much into these slides, and we will save time for questions at the end of these presentations. But that's how we got, about, that's how we got here, and that's why we're building in batteries with uh, uh, the microgrids that we deploy. And, and, and that's, I guess, another point of differentiation is that when you think about campuses or uh, large facilities, a megawatt and above, uh, for my focus, and you think about the microgrid rigor and the the resiliency built into a microgrid with a megawatt battery energy storage storage system in in tandem with that, that that's that's the approach for the resiliency and the and the sustainability that we're looking for. Again, the point of this presentation, as Seth mentioned, is that. These systems can be paid for, in fact, by the ISO, uh, the demand response programs or frequency regulation programs, and also the utility demand savings programs that, that Steve went into great detail about. So I think the point is, is that you should think about these uh, new technologies, battery energy storage, for not just cutting your bills, but also resiliency and to optimize the assets that you have. One of the uh, interesting points that Steve made was uh, uh, integration of battery storage with uh, uh, solar. And we not only see a lot of solar integration, and, and there's a lot of uh, software for integrating that in the proper way, but also uh, natural gas uh, CHP plants. A lot of uh, facilities now have natural gas CHP plants for peak load shaving, and, and again, integration of that with batteries is really critical. So you'll see a lot of um, studies uh, that we've done and other people have done on just that. Uh, you know that part about <laughs> Schneider, so I won't go through that slide. But here's an interesting slide that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, and this is the ISO markets. Uh, the, uh, this is a part of the uh, electrical system that we're, we really don't focus on very much. We're not very well aware of. But in addition to your serving utilities above them, you have your ISOs. And these ISOs have various programs to pay for uh, bat megawatt battery energy storage. Uh, the, in the case of PJM, uh, PJM is that purple uh, section that goes from Chicago, believe it or not, all the way over to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, skipping uh, over a little bit of uh, the Nipsco area, but but it's uh, that purple area. And, and PJM specifically has frequency regulation that helps pay for battery energy storage. But if you're in the New York ISO, they have uh, demand response programs. And, and again, uh, pick on your area. If you're in the white areas, I feel sorry for you right now. Don't worry, it'll come. Uh, but the um, colored areas are really the areas that are the hottest areas for megawatt battery energy storage, specifically in the United States. And again, I'll get into it in the next slide, but these, these ISOs do have programs in place to pay for uh, battery storage. And here are the programs. And again, this is a very difficult to read slide. I apologize to you. But if you look at the top of the slide, you'll see all the ISOs across the top. And then on the left-hand uh, column on the, on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see all the different programs. And again, you can summarize them by, if you just pick on PJM, it's frequency regulation. On, on New York ISO, it's demand response. And again, I don't mean to confuse people with, with jargon or words or acronyms for that matter, uh, 
um, because when I say utility demand savings programs, that could be peak shaving or, or, you know, there's millions of different definitions or descriptions of what I'm talking about. But don't be confused. They can all be distilled and put into a Excel spreadsheet quite nicely, as we have done many times, and we'll be glad to do them for for you. Uh, it's 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 not it's it's not that uh, difficult once you you translate a lot of these things. But as you can see on the left, there's tons of different programs that are paying for battery energy storage, uh, whether it be demand response or frequency regulation with the different ISOs. And again, it depends on where your facilities are located. You may be a national organization with multiple campuses across the United States that would participate in several of these ISO programs. But uh, again, it, it's uh, you know it's pretty simple uh, when you distill it down to an Excel formula of revenues and, and, and income generation from the different ISOs, and then also have a separate line item just for you know, utility demand savings programs. It's like my slide is stuck. Ah, there we go. Oops, sorry. Um, here's a good slide on, uh, we talked about utility demand savings programs. And again, I, I use the word demand savings in a general term to explain peak load shaving or, uh, uh, again, a lot of different utilities have different names for the programs. They're full of acronyms. Obviously, they're all graduates of uh, some governmental military agencies, but <laughs> The, you, here's a good example of how they've tried to distill this into an easy to understand format. This is uh, Con Ed Solutions, which happens to be a, um, a energy savings performance contractor, a division of Con Ed, the utility. But here's how they've tried to put it into simple English, which I think is extremely helpful. And again, uh, these can be easily translated to Excel formulas. It's not very, very sophisticated or difficult. And as we all know in this phone call, if it is, it's not to be believed. So it's got to be very transparent and simple. And it can be you know, when you uh, take the time and care. And again, we'd be glad to help anybody go through this process if they have a need. But uh, it, it's, it's uh, and certainly the utilities have been extremely helpful because they want these demand savings programs to be successful. So each, each, everybody on the phone call does have a utility, quote unquote, salesperson or, or contact lead that they can work with to distill what the program benefit is to them specifically. And you can see, too, on these uh, programs, you've got 100 kilowatts and 500 uh, kilowatts. Those are programs that would fit Steve's solution very, very nicely. You've got the one megawatt uh, program in the far uh, right-hand column that would fit our focus specifically. So there, there's all kinds of different programs depending upon which, which uh, utility you're being served by. And, and again, we'd be glad to help you walk through. One, one question a lot of people uh, like to understand is what are the elements? You know, Steve did a great job explaining the software and the hardware and the financing. In, in our case, the three partners that we work with to deploy systems on a megawatt scale uh, for uh, uh, your facilities are, uh, again, Schneider does the microgrid design build, uh, EPC, engineer procure construct that type of thing. And the software we deploy with that integrates the batteries with the grid and your buildings and your solar and your natural gas CHP and whatever else, uh, we call that demand side operations, but it's, a, it's a obviously Schneider Electric um, uh, software that, that, that makes sure everything is balanced and proper. Now on the battery side, we partner with all the battery manufacturers. and. Um, you know, lithium ion, God bless uh, the, the cell phones and the iPhones, because they're the locomotive pulling that train. Uh, the other big user of lithium ion, of course, are uh, electric vehicles, which, which uh, really haven't taken off all that much in the United States. But God bless, you know, uh, uh, Tesla and the work that Elon Musk has done, because he's popularized what is a lithium ion battery. A lot of us don't really know that a lithium ion battery is in your iPhone. 
but people do know who Elon Musk is today, and they do know what what a Tesla looks like. Thank God, <laughs> because that popularization I think has brought a lot of literacy to a lot of people, and it's been very helpful. So, uh, the battery manufacturers again are driven by the the, the, the locomotive pulling that train, or the cell phones, and the electric vehicles. Um, there are American manufacturers, great ones that we work with here in the United States that actually do their uh, uh, packaging and their quality control in the United States, quite a few of them, and they're great people. Uh, obviously, the Japanese have a bunch. Uh, the Koreans, of course, have a bunch, and the Chinese have a bunch. So that's the primary uh, people that are in the battery business. They're, they're um they're, they're all really uh, good. I mean, there's qualitative sides to everybody's quantitative price and, and performance. But, but uh, again, it, it's um, it's it's an open market and it's developing very fast. I mean, the, you've heard the announcement that Tesla is going to build a gig factory and, and it is building a gig factory in Clark, Nevada. And and it, and and I can assure you, there's probably 10 gig factories in China today. So there's uh, there is going to be continual market growth of lithium ion for battery energy storage. Thank God uh, for the cell phones and the and the electric vehicles for pulling that along. And then uh, the uh, far right uh, little box is the developer and operator. There's um, these are. Uh, if you think of real estate with somebody that does the permitting, the, the, the packaging, the, the complete uh, construction to perm type component, that's what a uh, uh, these, these developers and operators uh, are like. This is one. Uh, again, there's many of them. And you'll see, I think Steve mentioned too, or Seth, that you'll also see the solar farmers uh, uh, get into this developing battery farms as well. So uh, the, the developers and the operators of the systems are multiple, there's many of them, they're all uh, great uh, uh, professionals and uh, easy to work with and we, we integrate our, the technology with all of them. Uh, in the bottom uh, box, I thought it would be helpful for you to see the fastest growing markets. Um, I think Steve mentioned this too. It's uh, typically the coasts, but Chicago, because it's at the end of the line for PJM, the ISO that serves uh, that Chicago market, the PJM frequency regulation revenue income is quite significant. In fact, they have a multiplier. It's three times uh, multiplier just because Chicago is at the end of the line. Um, but so Chicago is an attractive market uh, for PJM frequency regulation revenue income. In New York, it's the NISO demand response and, and, and couple that with your serving utility, let's say Con Ed, utility demand savings, revenue income. And then of course in California you have the California ISO and PG and E or Southern California Edison or whoever the serving utility is for demand savings revenue income. So you add those two together and that's how you, you get paybacks of, you know, under five years. Uh, last slide that I thought would be of value to everybody on the phone call is how long does this take on a megawatt scale? And the good news is I I, I, I blanked out all the task descriptions to, to to spare you, but it's really a four to five month process. So it's not, <clears throat> the good news is you don't have to do uh, big exhaustive studies. You're not regulated by FERC. You're on the customer side of the substation. Uh, customer side of the meter, so there are no uh, uh, massive investments in terms of um, uh, studies and costs, and, and, the, and the implementation time is quite quite uh, easy. And again, like Steve's, no cost and, and upfront investment. We do this too as well with megawatt battery energy storage on the customer side. Uh, we we provide the batteries at no cost and. and and uh, also provide an income stream over the period of time. So it's uh, it's quite uh, interesting if you're in those specific markets that I, I showed you on the ISO map earlier, uh, and and you you have an interest in these types of things. It's it's quite easy to reach out and do a quick pro forma on uh, what is the revenue income both from the ISO and the utility 
utility demand savings programs, and how does that relate to the current costs of lithium-ion batteries or uh, engineer procure construct and uh, and certainly the the cost of operating and maintaining the system over ten year type thing. So that's uh, please reach out if I can help. Be glad to help you and thank you very much. Great, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks, Steve. That was a um, re really great presentation. Uh, we've had a number of questions come through, so we're going to move right on into those now. Um, so apologies, I don't know if we'll get to all of them. Um, oh, yes, yeah, also we have some contact information for uh, Steve and Mark. Uh, please reach out to the ghost guys if you have any questions that don't get answered today. And, um, okay, uh, also we, we've had a number of questions related to the uh, frequency regulation market in PJM, which I think we might have enough information for a whole other webinar, so might not get into those so much, uh, to say that off the front. So one of the questions that's come through from a couple of people, and I think um, both of you guys can address this, is what is the projected lifetime of the batteries in your systems? Steve, you want to go first? Yeah, I can, I can tackle that. And it really does depend upon the chemistry. Um, but the average life, life cycle that we're seeing with the lithium ion battery is between 12 and 14 years. Um, all of the battery suppliers that we work with, we require a 10 year manufacturer direct warranty. Um, and so I think you just, you need to look at two facets there, which is how are the batteries treated? And in peak demand shaving, the batteries are typically only being used between about 60 to 90 percent of their capacity uh, of the available capacity. So when you're only using 30 percent of what's there, uh, it tends to extend the life of those. If you're using a battery in the frequency market where you're you are significantly hitting it hard, uh, you know, in in a second by second basis, the life of those batteries derates substantially faster. Um, and I'm just talking right here about lithium ion. Obviously, lead acid has a much shorter uh, life cycle, but um, that's what we've seen, and that's what we're we are getting from the manufacturers that we work with. So, Mark, I don't know what yeah, you want to add to that. Yeah, the the other point is that in our systems we have an ongoing monthly O and M or operations and maintenance, both from the battery manufacturer and from Schneider Electric, so that they're monitoring the battery live each cell within the battery, because if you think of what this looks like, it, it, it looks like a server farm, really. That's what these battery uh, cells look like, is, is, is actually, if you think about what a, what a server looks like in a, in a server room, that's what they look like. So each one of the cells are monitored, and we pay, uh, and, and the battery manufacturer is glad to receive, a monthly O&M, or operations and maintenance. So if they do have degraded and and, uh, and and broken cells within the battery system, they replace them. Great. Thanks. Yeah, you're right. You're right about the lifespan. That's the typical lifespan. Um, so I think this is mainly for Steve at Green Charge. Um, so there's a question on how the aggregation of battery solutions work and if the properties have to be contiguous in order to be able to share the battery. No, it's a, it's a great question, and really when we start aggregating multiple sites, we will put individual systems at each of the sites, and then we are able to, obviously each site or each battery system would respond to the changes in load profile for that specific site. But what happens frequently is you have one site that may be experiencing a peak demand event, and then you have others that are not doing anything. So our software can is all connected to our network operations center, and we know the, the expected available capacity of all of the sites together. And it's that capacity that we can aggregate and then deliver back to the utility for uh, either demand response or other utility programs in order to drive additional savings for the customer. Great. Um. Another question that's come up with people is uh, the efficiency of your uh, storage solution as far as the round trip energy in and energy out. And a couple of related questions to those, and we can just hit on all of them. Um, how much does the, the HVAC, HVAC systems, the cooling systems, affect that efficiency? And what are the effects of temperature 
and siding systems in indoors and outdoors. Kind of a lot, but maybe we could touch on those a bit, uh, whoever wants to take this. Uh, Mark, okay. do you want to take yeah. it? I can drive in. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it, so I can. I just don't yeah, want you to feel left out. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead, Steve. That's a depends one for me. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great question because you really do need to understand the impact of efficiency and temperature on these systems. So our normal operating efficiency is 92%. So uh, it's one of the highest in the industry, and it is critical because in any analysis you want to do, you want to understand what is the impact and losses uh, on your savings by either consuming electricity from just, you know, converting AC to DC or by using your cooling system. Um, and you do get a, depending upon, you know, if I install a system in downtown San Francisco, which averages about 60 degrees in the summer, and I compare that to a system sitting in Palm Springs where the average temperature is over 100 degrees, you are getting uh, additional energy consumption and you are using the HVAC unit more substantially. So uh, you, you would, your, whoever you would work with or get information on should calculate those line losses separately and be able to provide that information because one of the things we have seen is if you install a system, let's say indoors, and it's in an electrical room without any HVAC, the first thing that happens in the summer is the temperature of that uh, room tends to increase above what the manufacturer's warranty allows. So you've just invalidated all the warranties of that battery manufacturer. So most people aren't thinking of installing HVAC in their electrical room uh, if it's not included in their energy storage unit. So it, it's something you want to pay attention to. We do prefer to run the batteries, obviously, either in a shade structure or in a cooler environment where possible. But many of our customers, uh, it, they're they're their uh, facility doesn't allow that. So that's why you want to calculate that. In my case, the Schneider approach, uh, these are uh, containerized 40-foot or 20-foot containers, and all of them are included with HVAC. So, And that's monitored live both by Schneider and the battery manufacturers. So that's how we care for uh, the batteries and the, uh, with HVAC in each, each installation. So, actually related to that, Mark, um, since you provide a containerized solution, uh, there was a question as to, because of the size of your systems, if Schneider Electric has considered any other technologies that are not battery-based, such as compressed air. No, that's a great question. We, we haven't done, we haven't honestly done anything. We've done a lot of microgrids with different technologies, but not, for instance, compressed air or uh, and there are the other energy savings technologies that are that are available. So uh, I guess it might be because of our legacy and history of APC doing UPS batteries for many, many years. We do over a billion dollars a year just in UPS batteries just because of APC, and that might be the reason. But we haven't done compressed air. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think one of the things is this also asked about Pumped hydro, which is very location specific, and compressed air can be the same. Although there are units that uh, that can be built uh, anywhere, but they, they tend to be a bit more location specific than batteries themselves. So. Uh, another question that I, I think it's important to to take a look at, and again to throw this open to either of you, is is how um, having on-site renewables impact the case for storage. Are there additional revenue streams that it provides? Does it make the systems more economical or less? I know this is, again, probably very subjective on uh, uh, location to location. Um, Steve, you want to take this first? Yeah, no, solar is a great attribute to storage because it does provide a number of things that help the storage system uh, and the solar system when you combine the two. The first is, um, being able to use either smaller a smaller battery system because the solar system is helping mitigate most of the peak demand during the middle of the day. Um, the second benefit that we see most often is that in the event that the solar system trips or if you get cloud cover, the energy storage system will be able to jump in and reduce the peak demand um, for that specific building load. 
Uh, one of the things that we've done with some of our larger partners uh, in the solar side, like Sun Edison, is we've directly integrated our network operations center with their network operations center so we can understand what the expected performance and the failure data in the event that the system goes out so that we can react differently. Because if you think about it, if, if a solar system, just the inverter trips based on a voltage spike and it's coming back on in 10 minutes, um, if we knew that up front, then we would put 100% of our battery capacity to mitigate those charges. If we don't have that connection, then we're just guessing and we're slowly increasing the uh, peak demand or the set point um, in order to, to try and reduce that impact. So I think it is very strong. I think where you will continue to see that to expand um, is especially on the East Coast where as a resiliency, you can operate facilities at a reduced level when you combine the renewable energy and the solar and the storage together um, to run those operations when, when systems goes down. So we are in the pot process of uh, putting together some pilots with some large retailers where they could run registers, reduce lighting uh, when the grid goes down by combining renewable energy and, um, and solar. I think the other one which uh, Mark mentioned that we're seeing a lot of push for in the federal government and in other markets is microgrids, where they're running, whether it's with fuel cells, uh, solar, and energy storage as a combined solution to run the operation and then really use the grid as a backup. So I think those are some of the, the real advantages that um, we're seeing in the market. and. Um, I think you'll see even more of that over the next 12 months. Great, and I want to uh, let you weigh in on this as well, Mark, but in addition to that, uh, Steve, you mentioned microgrids, and, and Mark, there was a question directed to you also asking about what you see as the, uh, what's the growth potential, or what do you see, how do you see the market moving for um, non-utility microgrid growth? Uh, I, yeah, that's an excellent question because I really do think that the non-utility uh, microgrid growth is really what is going to be the biggest growth in the market. Again, this is my uh, view of the world, so please excuse me. But um, because you now have the development of lithium-ion batteries becoming affordable uh, in uh, on the present with in, in all sizes, uh, megawatt included, and then you have the ISO and, and utility demand response programs paying uh, for these facilities. Uh, that's where I think microgrids and and and, and people will approach this you know, in, a, in a megawatt battery energy storage way in with microgrid rigor, and that's good because again my my thought and vision is that the grid will be upgraded over time just like the quilts. There will be a patchwork of microgrids behind the meter from these uh, people on the call that are very energy literate, very cognizant of what's going on, and they're going to take control of these situations themselves. They've started with solar, they've started with CHP, uh, and they're going to graduate to uh, batteries with microgrid uh, resiliency built in. And I think that's going to be the growth because, uh, you know, as much as we all love utilities, which we don't, but typically they're not going to be at the forefront of doing this kind of thing. Um, and certainly they're not going to be able to go to the PVC and ask for money to build microgrids. It's, it's just very, very difficult. So, again, I think the, the commercial reality that, that, that Steve has talked about and that I've talked about where you can get these systems paid for with the existing programs out there, um, is going to cause the commercial side of behind the meter, behind behind your own substation to be the popular growth, an explosive growth side of the market. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, I, I know I know we're seeing that in the Northeast, particularly a number of states have come out with microgrid programs that are looking to get these going, and these are non-utility based programs for for resiliency purposes. Um, Here's one. We'll see if, if either of you can give a, a good answer on this. People are curious about what kind of a return on investment we're looking at for these systems. Uh, either of you want to share that information? Yeah. Steve, you always go first. Well, thank you. I uh, <laughs> feeling feeling like I owe you something here, but um, 
It, it really is dependent on two factors. So it is based on the current demand cost uh, and the load profile of a customer. So some of our best markets, let's say in San Diego with a volatile load profile, you're seeing a sub two year payback um, on an energy storage system and a commercial customer. The average between, I would say, New York and California, you're looking typically at a three to five year payback. Um, and when you start getting into some demand charges without incentives below $20, you're looking closer to eight to nine year paybacks. And that's just on the peak demand shaving. If you're able to do frequency or other services in the Midwest, you're typically looking at a sub five year payback. Um, and, and so that's what we're seeing with commercial customers today. Yeah, that Mark, this is Mark from Schneider. Uh, the, on the megawatt scale, the same, same uh, metrics apply. What, what Steve said is exactly right for the, even the big scale megawatt size. The, um, the IRRs and the ROIs uh, and the financial analysis are all double digit in, in the ISO markets that I uh, showed you the slide on. In the white spots, so if you're in those, those uh, ISO markets, you're going to be in good shape with double-digit IRRs and ROIs. And paybacks, as Steve said, uh, in the three to five years for typical uh, California, New York, Chicago-type market. All right. Uh, I've got a resiliency question here. I think, uh, I think I'm going to... Ask you, Mark, if you talk a little bit uh, on is there a, how does it work to for a customer that's interested in, in having the resiliency benefit? How do you balance the revenue side with leaving enough battery there to be available to support critical load when the grid goes down? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and 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 again, that's sizing, right? Because we always undersize the batteries to load anybody to care for the ISO demand or the, the utility demand requests because you have to be live and you have to be available 24-7 all the time. And, and they test you at 3 in the morning, of course. So uh, if you also want backup power and UPS and emergency uh, uh, energy, th that's we would size the batteries accordingly and work it out so that you're able to call upon those events when you need them. Great. So I think we're going to pretty much close down uh, the questions for now. We're, we're getting towards the end here, and I'd like to leave just a little bit of time uh, for, for you guys, Steve and Mark, if you have any parting thoughts that you'd like to share with anybody. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Well, first of all, again, I wanted to say thank you. Um, we've got uh, an email here, uh, info at GreenChargeNet, if you would like um, some more information. We do provide a free evaluation, uh, or even if you just want more clarification on how energy storage works and how it could benefit either you as a commercial entity or as a utility. Um, I think we've got a number of videos and informational items on our website. And um, I really appreciate everyone joining today. I think it's a fantastic uh, market opportunity, and uh, a lot of it's about education. So I really do appreciate the Green Energy Group and the Resilient Power Project uh, in providing this forum for people to learn more about how it, energy storage can really help them. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, and, and kudos to Seth and Sam for putting together this webinar. It was really valuable. And we we should have follow-on ones, but thank you to all the participants for the great questions. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you both so much. This has been great, and uh, it's been a great bunch of questions. Thank you for everybody who contributed to that. And sorry to anyone whose questions we didn't get to. You reach out to these guys or reach out to, to us here. Um, and the slides will be available online. We'll uh, we'll be sending those out when uh, when they're they're posted. Everybody can take a look at those, and this webinar has been recorded, so that will be uh, available as well. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, Sam, do you have any sort of housekeeping stuff to finish this off? Sure.
Sure. Thanks, Seth. Um, so just a couple of things to point out on your screen. You can see a couple of links. One is to our uh, Resilient Power Project newsletter, which comes out every month. That's a great resource. And on that, you will get information about upcoming webinars and previous webinars, other reports and resources that may be of interest. Uh, our web address is on your screen, resilientpower.org. And uh, just some contact info for Clean Energy Group and our host, Seth, if you're interested in that. And that's it for us today. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us.